Hello, Global Gardeners. Let's get your gardening week started by answering all the gardening questions we can get to in the next 90 minutes. I'm ready. Hope you are. I've already been outside in my garden today, did watering. I even did a little bit of weeding and I was trellising some tomatoes. So it's still relatively early morning for me, but I've been outside in the garden and I know some of you are just coming in now. Maybe you're listening out in the garden. What a great way to start the gardening week. Shout out to Heidi and Jay, our fabulous moderators who have already been active in the comments before we even started. And happy Canada Day to the Canadians and happy Independence Day to all of us in the U.S. It's one of those celebratory weekends and I think some of you probably have today off from work as a result of that. So. That's wonderful. Hope we can get your questions answered. Go ahead and put them in the comments section. And as I see them, and as we scroll down, we'll get to the comments and make this as informative a morning as possible. Or afternoon if you're across the pond, or late evening, early morning if you're on the other side of the planet. There's always something we want to be learning about gardening. Hi. Carla, Carla says, I had such a late planting this year. Don't know if I'll get anything, but at least there's green out there. Yeah, I, I, I'm in the same mode. I am so late getting most of my plants in the ground, but everything is green because of the cool weather and the rain we've been having. And I think that's a big part of gardening is just seeing some green whether it's the weeds or what we put in the ground and whether we get a harvest or not sometimes is just incidental it's getting out there and enjoying the activity and seeing the insects and all the rest of the things like that hey sonia moran in central florida hope everyone's garden is growing well and it's even for those of you that it's winter and your gardens may have faded Hope you're starting to get into that planning mode and that prep mode from for next year so you can get everything going. This is one of those things that I'm always planning. I'm always prepping. But of course, there are some times of the year that it's better than others. And right you now, right now, this morning, I was out doing some of my watering and weeding and already thinking, Next year, I think I'll try this a different plant in this bed. The plants in that bed aren't even growing to the point yet that I can even be thinking about a harvest for this year. And I'm already thinking about what I'm going to grow in that bed next year. So that's just the craziness of a gardener's mind is we're always getting ahead of ourselves. Gardens happen, says my areas had two modes, blazing hot or pouring rain. Yeah, we haven't got into the blazing hot yet here in Colorado, which is a little unusual. We we are at or slightly below normal temperature for uh, so far in the month of July. We're holding at about 80 degrees, give or take a little bit. That's about 27 Celsius and we're normally warmer than this so i'm expecting the blazing hot to come and we've been enjoying the rain because it's it's incredibly rare for us to get so much rain so it's always fun dusty flat says between the deer and watering i'm not sure which i dislike the most i would put deer in that category i like to water i like to get out and hand water by hand watering i can see my plants daily i can see how well they're growing. I, I've got cilantro, you'll see it in the video coming out on Thursday. I've got cilantro growing in one of my tomato beds and it's already starting to bolt and it wasn't that way a couple days ago. So hand watering gets me out there. Of course, it adds to the chores when I notice things like I got to deal with the cilantro that's bolting, but I, I prefer the hand watering. It's the deer that I have the issue with. That's why I've got cages and fences around all of my plants. Mom has been doing a really good job keeping the deer out of the garden so far this year, but they still creep in when we're in bed. So it's one of those things that it's it's a problem for some of us and dealing with the problem is definitely a pain 
Isabel, Isabel has a question. I wonder if plants will survive with all the smog created by the Quebec forest fires. So yes, they will survive. And so um, those of you who are, are from Oregon, Carla, for instance, maybe can add a few words. With all the fires that Oregon had in recent years, it does affect how the plants grow. And when we had a, a spate of wildfires and we're getting smoke from a bunch of wildfires in recent years, it did affect my plants. It's not going to kill the plants, but it's like having overcast days. The plants are not getting the sunlight for the photosynthesis for them to grow to their best. And in some cases, the ashes are actually falling in the garden and coating the leaves, which adds an, an extra problem. So the garden will, will, should survive all of the smoke from the Canadian wildfires, but it will probably not be a great gardening year because the plants are most certainly going to be smaller, not as strong. And don't be surprised if next year some of those plants don't make it through the winter because they didn't build enough energy stores this year. So just be ready for that. That That is one of those things that it's terrible to have to deal with, but but the plants will recover. That's part of our, our normal natural cycle is to have wildfires and plants have learned to adapt over all of the years to be able to, to handle it. Dusty Flats is saying, OMG, you have no idea how dry it is here. The trees are dying. I, I feel your pain. We had a, a couple years ago, we had that problem. My neighbor behind me had, I think, 12 trees. I, I think I've told this story before. Maybe the number goes up every time I tell it. But they actually lost 10 trees. And they had a tree service come in and cut down their 12 trees in their backyard. So they used to have more trees, and now there's none because... It, we have been in severe drought conditions here in Colorado, some portions of Colorado, and have lost a lot of trees. And up and down my street, there are still dead trees in the front and back. My two dead trees in my backyard, I, I left in the ground just to see what would happen. They're not completely dead. They've got portions that are starting to, to pop up and grow some new branches. But uh, yeah, when, you, when you're dealing with dry, the trees suffer and so and most of the time it's actually not the year of the drying that is the that is the, when you see most of the damage most trees will store energy in their roots and so in one dry year you may not see much damage to the tree at all but the next year if it's dry as well the tree begins using up all that energy and all those stores to support it and usually it's in the third year that you really start seeing trees dying after severely dry conditions one one dry year is usually not enough to kill a lot of trees but two or three years yeah that, that's definitely one of those things that that you'll see it and and we have forests here in colorado with entire hillsides of the trees dying from those kind of drought conditions in recent years. So if you're growing fruit trees or if you have landscape trees, don't forget to give them really good soaking water on a regular basis when you have drying spells. We know to do it in our vegetable garden and in our containers, but we don't always think about it with our trees because we think trees just grow naturally and there's nothing we need to do about it, especially if normally you're getting a lot more rain. So get out there and deep soak your trees when you have those dry conditions, and that'll definitely help. Gardening with Caitlin is saying, have you tried black cow compost? It's terrible this year. My pepper plants are suffering because it doesn't have any nutrients. It's more like a mulch than a compost this year. I haven't tried it. It's not readily available in my area. Uh, I was asked a question about it a few weeks ago and looked into it, and and that was one of those things that, that I saw in the comments on a few different sites is that it's not a consistent product, that sometimes it's chunkier than other times and mixed results. I can't speak personally to how effective it is, but I'm sorry to hear that, that you haven't had 
very good results with it this year. And, and most of the time when, when I use a, a store-bought product, uh, I'm ready to add fertilizer. You know, I don't normally use fertilizer in my vegetable garden because I'm amending my beds and using all that organic matter to feed the soil organisms and keep my soil nice and healthy. But if I'm using the store-bought materials like that, not only are they sometimes lacking in nutrients, but they're almost always sterilized so that there's no life to them at all. And so adding some fertilizer and mixing them into the soil will help, but it's not an overnight solution. So it's one of those things that uh, live and learn. And if you want to try that brand again, consider adding some of those things maybe next year, like the fertilizer. And so Deb C is saying it's still raining in Massachusetts. And so uh, dry or rain, it's just one of those things that so many of us are dealing with those kind of problems. And it, it's, it, it really is, I think, a case for a garden journal or some way of keeping track of what's happening in your garden when you have drought or when you have extraordinary rainy conditions. Keep track of how the plants are growing, which plants are doing well, which plants aren't doing well, so that in the future, if you get those kind of conditions again, you've already got your lessons learned and it can make it a little bit easier for the next time. Marsha Davenport, hello, says Marsha from Piedmont, North Carolina. Can I leave perennial herbs or onions in my green stock over winter or will they freeze and die? Um, you can probably do that in North Carolina. I'm, I'm guessing you're in zone seven and a lot of it depends on the plant. And so my time here in uh, Colorado zone 5b, my time overwinters regardless of what container I put it into. I have time growing in those little empty spaces in my concrete block bed. And in those little five inch square spots, the time is just bulletproof. And it comes back every year. I've got time growing in pots that I forget to water and it comes back over the winter. So there are some plants like that that are very hardy and can do very well. But rosemary, for instance, won't overwinter in the ground or in a pot or in a green stock in my garden. And so I am growing rosemary this year in pots and I'll bring those pots indoors. So it depends on the plant as to whether you can keep it in the green stock over the winter based on your zone and based on how hardy the, the, the plant is. Now, the one thing about the, the green stock is it, it will freeze. If you have freezing conditions in winter, it will freeze. So that's why you need to match the plant to your zone if you get those freezing conditions. It'll also dry out. You, keep, you need to keep watering it during the winter as well. And so I know people, not just green stocks, but all containers will stop watering their plants once the plants go dormant. And that's really something you want to avoid. You want to, to water those plants on those days when the temperature warms up above 40 degrees Fahrenheit, about four and a half Celsius. When the sun is out and the days are a little bit warmer, even during the winter, go ahead and put water to uh, those containers or to the green stock and that'll help. But the, the herbs and onions, um, they should do okay. I actually accidentally overwintered some onions in my green stock a couple years ago. I was growing some onions from seed as an experiment, started them late, they didn't really grow that well. And then I just ignored them for the most part during the winter and they were growing in spring um, unexpectedly. And so, yeah, th there's a lot of those kind of plants that, that can do well in a green stock, but, but be selective in what, uh, what it is that you are, are putting into it. Jacob says, I'm a one man squash bug apocalypse. Good for you. I go out and kill five to 10 adults every day. Is there a more effective way of removing them from my garden other than killing them individually? <clears throat> and so uh, that, that's a great idea. And if you can 
kill five to ten a day, you can definitely keep up with any infestation. The thing about squash bugs, and this holds true for, for most of those type of pests in the garden, is recognizing their life cycle. And so when you have an insect that, as an adult, will lay eggs either in the plant or in the soil, learning that lifestyle can really help you for the next year. So for this year, squash bugs are one of those things that you, they don't really trap well, and they're not an insect that, that other predators are eating on a regular basis. And so the best way to control them is really to just pluck them off the plant when you can. But look for their eggs. Look for how where their habitat is, and you can kind of disrupt them. And, and so all of the, the insects like that, you can keep the population down in later years. The insects that are burying their, their eggs and then the eggs hatch into larvae in the soil and then crawl up into the plant and eat the plant. Well, often in the spring, if you just loosen up and dig up your soil, if you know you have that kind of pest, you can disrupt the life cycle, expose the larva, and you won't have a problem. If it's an insect that lays eggs on the plant and that and lives over the course of the winter in that plant debris and then emerges in the spring to eat the rest of your garden, you can help out by getting rid of all that plant debris, composting it or putting it into uh, an area where if the insects emerge, there's something to eat and they'll die. So, uh, yeah, look into those kind of actions for the squash bug to to try to disrupt the egg laying and the the larva growth and uh, and that holds true with all those kind of insects and it really can be pretty helpful in the future. I knock on wood haven't seen any pests yet in my garden. And part of that is because of all my flowers and my grasses and my herbs and the diversity of plants I have in my garden. It's attracting the predators of all types. And so I haven't seen any squash bugs yet because most of my plants are just starting to grow. But there's another option for the future. When you learn the life cycle, and so the squash bugs tend to arrive relatively early in the season. And if you've got plants growing that they'll eat, you're now encouraging their population. If you can delay your planting, then that's one way of disrupting their life cycle. They wake up, they emerge, they're looking for food to eat, and you've got nothing growing, they're going to fade away and die. And so I think that's one of those things, even though it's been a pain in my garden starting so late, I'm not seeing any pests because any pests that would have been there were probably in place a month ago and none of my plants were growing. And so now that my squash is beginning to emerge and my cucumbers are beginning to emerge, there's nothing left to eat them. And, I, and so next year I can anticipate a relatively bug-free year for the same reason, because the adults are not alive at the same time that my plants are growing to lay eggs to cause those future generations. So a couple different ideas there. Jay is saying we had a wildfire smoke day last week that was off the charts. Yeah, in, in our national news, uh, there's been a lot of reports of the cities in northern U.S. and Canada that are ranking among the worst in the world for air pollution and telling everybody to stay indoors. And, and you're right, literally, in some cases, they're off the charts because the measurement of the smoke in the air is just so intense. So I hope that improves for you, Jay, and of course, for, for everybody in Canada and everyone being affected by the smoke. It is definitely something that we talked about last week and the week before, and I, let's just hope it, it clears out and we don't have to think about it anymore. TJ the Hawk, good morning to you. My garlic harvest this year in New Hampshire was much smaller compared to the past couple years. We had a super rainy June. Could this be the culprit? Yeah, it could. My my garlic crop as well is, is terrible this year. Um, I lost some plants because of all of the rain and the plants that are growing, I think are also suffering from too much rain. So uh, not enough water and too much water 
for most plants will affect how they grow and garlic is one of those. I would also probably throw in, I'm not sure what kind of temperatures you've had, but if your temperatures have been unusual, that's another thing that can also affect how the garlic grows. And I've been seeing this, they're, they're, uh, I'm not planning to do a video, uh, dedicated video about my garlic. I'll, I'll mention it. I'm planning a video at the end of my season and I'm planning to mention my garlic in that video along with lots of other things. But I've seen a few YouTube creators already talking about their garlic crops this year and how bad they are. So, uh, TJ, don't feel bad. There's a whole bunch of us <clears throat> that, that for different reasons are having a bad year with garlic. And one of the best solutions is just do it again next year. I, I planted hundreds of garlic bulbs last year and about half of them are growing right now next year i'll or at the end of this year i'll put more garlic in for next year because every year i grow garlic and every year i learn something new about the garlic and that's basically how you enjoy your gardening with garlic it's just keep doing it there are good years and there's bad years last year i had a really good year this year's a pretty bad year who knows what next year is going to bring so uh just stay on that bicycle and keep riding and hopefully you'll get to the point where you have that good year and, and it's worthwhile. Will it grow? Hello. For the first time I planted plum trees and was told not to fertilize them. Is this info proper? Yeah, fertilizing in the first year of fruit trees is is really not recommended. There's really no need to do it and and I don't do it and I don't suggest others do it as well. And when you look at, at a lot of the nursery guidelines, I'll tell you, not to fertilize in the first year as well. The And even in the second and third year, you can maybe begin fertilizing, but, but I'm not a big fertilizing person when it comes to my fruit trees. In that first year, the tree is just getting established. The roots are just beginning to grow. They're, they're beginning to anchor the tree in the ground. And so you're really not gaining much by using a fertilizer. Most of the fertilizers that are directed towards fruit growth are, are for when the tree is actively growing to flower and then fruit. And in that first year, you're probably not getting any flowers. And if you do get flowers, you should probably pinch them off because you want all of the, the tree's energy going into that root development and that initial growth. So uh, I'd, I would go ahead and take that suggestion that you got from whomever and don't waste your time fertilizing a fruit tree in the first year and even the second year i my approach is more of letting the tree grow in whatever the native soil is and so fruit trees especially if you're growing a dwarf or a semi-dwarf fruit tree is going to have a smaller root system but even when you fertilize, you're never going to cover the area that those roots are actually growing in. And so some fertilizer might help if you've got really, really, really bad soil. But my approach is just to mulch everything really well with a wood chip mulch and then to occasionally spread alpaca manure or chicken manure on top of that. And that will enrich the soil overall in a much broader area over time. And then as those fruit tree roots grow into new areas, the soil underneath that mulch is a little bit better than it was in the very beginning. And all the trees I've grown here in Colorado with our terrible, terrible soil have, have done pretty well with no fertilizing at all. So that's the approach I take is, is just to let the tree grow as naturally as possible. I may not get as big a harvest as someone who fertilizes, but it's one less activity that I have to deal with and I still get pretty good harvests. Moon Dust is asking, do you have any recommendations for small grow lights just to get my seedlings started next year? And so for small grow lights, um, I, I go to the garden centers, the big box stores, and pick up just a, a small LED light. And you can, 
you get some LED lights that, that are high in the lumens and high in the K value, and that's, that's really what you're looking for for a grow light. And they're usually inexpensive, and they're available. I've, I've seen some squares that are like 12-inch square or 18-inch on a side, which is a nice small size for, uh, for plants. And, and they're, they're made to hang. So assuming you have a place to hang the lights, that's, that's an easy and uh, effective way to, to do some grow lights. If you want something that is self-supporting, then you may want to look at something that is actually intended as a grow light and it has its own support to it. Those are usually a more, little more expensive depending on how much you want to, to spend. So I don't have a particular brand or a particular design, uh, but, but I don't spend a lot of money and don't waste a lot of time uh, for, for those initial seedlings that I'm starting to get going. Now for that next step, and you can uh, check out some of the videos that I've made recently, with my uh, Vivosun light. And so I've started using Vivosun lights in some of my growing, but that's once the plants get established. And those lights are more expensive, but they're more powerful and they're really intended for the plant growth. But for the seedlings themselves, something just nice and simple is, is usually good enough to, to get you going. And then you don't have to worry too much about it. Rafaela Boo Boo, do you test for metals and chemicals when you get your soil tested? And so I don't do specific metal or chemical testing because I'm not worried about my area having been contaminated in the past. And, and so I just do basic soil tests and I get back basic results, just telling me how, how, nutrient rich or poor my soil is and I know my soil is poor it always is when I do the, the testing of it and so because I don't have that concern of contamination I'm not paying extra to get that additional testing if you are concerned about chemicals or heavy metals in your soil then absolutely get that kind of test and most of the the labs the commercial labs and the university libraries that are doing soil testing have that as an option. It, it's always an extra cost, but if it's a big concern of yours, it might be worth paying the, the extra to, to see if you, your soil is contaminated. And then you can move from there. I, I don't think contaminated soil needs to stop you from gardening. That's one big reason I'm a huge advocate of raised beds. You can build a raised bed on top of contaminated soil and put good soil in that raised bed and garden to your heart's content. But knowing in the beginning that your soil is bad is a good start. It is a good baseline as you move forward and, and often you do have to pay more for it. Gardening with Caitlin. Yep, finding that out the hard way. I filled my new green stocks with the black cow. I'll have to find something loftier for next year and more fertilizer i do have my own compost made now awesome yeah making your own compost to add to your soil and so one thing and i haven't done a video about it yet uh, a couple years ago i made my leaf mold and I, I did the video on how i made the leaf mold and i did a video about harvesting the leaf mold but when i harvested the leaf mold i put it into big uh, a big 50 gallon plastic garbage can. Well, it continues to decompose. All the, the fungi is still active in it. And so a year later, that is just so fluffy and so beautiful and so rich that, that I'll be doing more of that in the future. But making your own compost and making your own leaf mold are definitely options you should be pursuing when you're looking to improve the growing conditions. And so that's exactly what I'm planning to do with that, that leaf mold for next year. When I revitalize my green stock soil, I'll be adding a lot more of that leaf mold to it and improving it that way. 
rather than buying some nice fluffy material like peat moss or cocoa coir, I'm going to use my leaf mold. So yeah, make your own. That's definitely a good approach to take and can save you money and you know where it came from. Jay is saying the low quality and complications in sources for garden professional nutrients have driven me to produce my own garden nutrients. There you go. Hugo culture, compost, leaf mold, own mulch, etc. And the video that, that will be coming out on Saturday, I'll be discussing fertilizer, making my own fertilizer. And I'll show you how I do that as well, because uh, I completely agree. It's one of those things like be it black cow or something else. There's just so much diversity in what you buy and you never know what you're going to get, including all those horror stories. Some of you, I think, have shared them in the past with the, the glass and the plastic and the metal that is found in some of those store-bought bags. And I, I just want to stay away from that as much as possible. So I make my own and it's not that hard to do. If, if you're not doing it yet, again, get, get off the bandwagon and and start making your own stuff. Stony Gardener, hello. My onions are near harvest. When curing them, should it be done in a dry environment or is outside 60% humidity okay? It, it should be drier. 60% um, if it's like lying outside on top of the mulch in the sun and they're not going to be rained on, 60% really isn't that much of a problem. But if they're going to be exposed to higher humidity, and the possibility of some rain, then I would consider moving them into a, a drier environment. For my garlic and my onions, when I cure them, I cure them inside because there's always a chance of an afternoon thunderstorm here in Colorado. And I just don't want to run the risk of curing them outside and then having some of those potential problems develop. So I cure inside normally and normally my inside humidity is a little bit lower than what it is outside. And so that might be an option for you is just to be on the safe side. But I wouldn't worry too much about 60%. I'm not sure what the, the, the recommended humidity is for the best results, but, but they'll cure okay. It just will take a little bit longer when the humidity is a little bit higher. You just want to make sure that, that those outer paper layers are are drying and protecting the plant. And in a really, really high environment or a rainy environment, you can have mold set in before that happens. And that's really the reason to be curing in the first place. So, uh, so nice to see everybody here today. I love all the conversations going back to Dusty Flats and Brian Seabird and Jacob Moore and Jeremy Ransom. You all have been active and people are responding to you. So. This is just such a fantastic, and I love how everybody's working. Uh, Urban Chicken Mama saying one of the chickens has a hernia. Anyone else experience this? Uh, I've heard of that. I've had chickens. My daughter has chickens. My neighbor has chickens. And I haven't actually known anyone with a chicken with a hernia. But if you've got information about hernias out there, by all means, share it because I know that can be a problem. My neighbor had a big problem with mites last year and basically had no egg production for the whole year as they were dealing with uh, the mite issue and sterilizing the coop and giving all the medicines and, and dustings to the chickens. So there are those kind of things that definitely can add a problem when you're, when you're doing chickens. It's not always easy. There's often something that happened, but the hernia, uh, I'd, I'd be interested to see if anyone else has that experience as well. Nick from Yuna, how do you think artificial intelligence will affect gardening? Maybe soon we can buy robots to water for us. And so, um, I, you know, I've been wondering about this. I've actually uh, been planning a video and, and I, I'm not sure how I'm going to to produce it because the results are kind of iffy, but I've been playing with AI a little bit to see if I can get AI to, to write me a video script. And it does, but it, it's still not everything that I would put into a video. And so I think you're going to see a lot more of that where AI is going to be used for, 
for books and for videos and, and you know maybe some blogs but it's it's not complete at least what i've seen so far when you start moving into the next realm i will say my weather station from tempest has ai built into it and it's incredible i am just i did a video about it a few months ago i am just so impressed by that tempest weather station because it's learning and my forecast my garden forecast is actually being produced by that weather station and it's much more accurate than what i'm seeing in the national weather service and and with my other weather station and the ai however it's working is highly accurate all this rain we've been having all the wind it's a much more reliable source for me in the garden so i think that may be a direction that ai starts moving first is in some of those kind of things where we we, we use the information that the ai is is helping produce to help us in the garden i'm, I'm not sure about the the robot materials there is a product out there that will weed your garden it's, it's kind of like uh, the the robot that that uh, vacuums your carpet there's one of those that you can put into a bed and it will weed the bed by just moving around the bed and ripping up the weeds as they grow it takes a lot of space there's a lot of lost opportunity to grow plants but there are some of those tools quote unquote, that are coming onto the market that that have some of the electronics built into it. So I don't know. I, I, I It will no doubt have an effect, Nick. We're, it's going to be coming. It's just a question of which ones we decide to use first and which ones end up working well enough that they become commonplace. And I haven't seen anything yet that is really going to to give us that kind of result yet. But I'm sure it's coming. Hello, Moon Dust. If I buy garlic from the store, can I plant them or do I need to go to a, a different? Um, yeah, so you can plant any garlic from any store. The, the issues you might have, however, is some garlic companies will spray the garlic cloves with a chemical that inhibits that clove from growing because you don't want to go to the the store and look at the garlic bulbs and there's little green sprouts coming from all those cloves and so they'll spray it to keep those cloves from germinating so it's possible if you plant those cloves you might not get complete uh, growth and and you might not get a complete crop but a garlic plant will grow once it it does emerge and if it can fight off that chemical, it's going to grow. If you get an organic garlic bulb, it's less likely to have those kind of issues with it. And you just start growing it. The, the one thing, and it's not necessarily a big problem, but the one thing that, that causes me uh, a second thought when I look to do stuff like that is I don't know what the variety is. And I like knowing what I'm growing. And so it's not a big deal if, if it's a garlic that you like the taste of and it's usually cheaper to buy a garlic bulb in the produce section than it is to buy a garlic bulb at your nursery for the purpose of growing plants. You might save some money and you might find some garlic plants that do well in your area. They're most likely going to be soft neck garlic. And for those of us that live in northern regions, hardneck garlic tends to do better. And so matching the variety to your climate, again, it's a mystery. You don't necessarily know what you're getting. Here in the United States, most of the garlic in the stores comes from California. And so if your conditions are similar to the growing conditions in California, then using a store-bought clove to grow a plant may actually work pretty well and and can be one of those you know fun experiments to try so it, it usually isn't a big investment and i say go ahead and try it you may have good results and if you don't for the reasons that i was just talking about you may find out that 
that's one reason why it wasn't growing so well. So, some a couple things to, to think about. James Hanold is wondering, what plants are good to plant in the summer? I have one six-foot area that didn't germinate anything I planted, mid-high sun area. And so, uh, I, ha I have a couple videos where I talk about fall gardens. And so, summer is a great time to start thinking about your fall crops. The, the plants that can handle a little bit of frost, that can handle the cooler conditions of late summer and early autumn. And the time to put those in the ground is in summer. It, we're still early in summer, and for most of us that are early summer and we have a spot to grow, you really don't want to start your lettuce and your radish, those kind of fall crops. But you can start thinking about maybe something like Brussels sprouts and broccoli. Those cool season plants that take longer to grow, you can start them from seed outdoors in the summer. And by the time they start growing into plants, the weather's cooling. And about the time it's getting ready to harvest, it's about the time that that first frost hits. And that often makes those plants taste better. The root vegetables are the same way. I'll be putting uh, my, my beet seeds in the ground pretty soon. And I'll also be starting some carrots, some more carrots pretty soon for that reason, because they'll continue to grow when the conditions begin to cool. So I would look at those kind of things. Now you could also get away with some really fast growing summer plants. And so there are squashes that might only be 40 to 50 days to harvest. There, there are some that actually will grow that quickly. And there are some melons that may be in the 60 to 70 day range. And so if your season is long enough from right now to give you enough time for a couple weeks of germination and growth and then 70 days and, and, and frost won't come for 90 days, then go ahead and start some of those plants in that spot as well. But you do have to match the plant and its harvest time to really have the best results if you do some of that seeding and growing starting in in summer but definitely definitely options that you can consider when you're 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 looking to more than what's growing right now summer growing is more than just tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and squashes and melons it's the beginning of that autumn season and so when you look at that that future and plan for that point, then you can actually find some plants that may actually do pretty well with you. So thank you, Gardening with Caitlin, a new member of the Gardner Scott community. I appreciate that. Look forward to seeing you on some of the other options we have as a member of the channel. That's fantastic. Thank you. And uh, lots of other people responding to that as well. That's fantastic. Now, Strain Nursery. Thank you, Gardener Scott. Still learning about gardening. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that super chat. I appreciate that contribution. And that's why I'm here, is to help you learn about gardening, as is the reason I think a lot of others are here, which is why it's so fantastic that the comment section is so active with people answering other people's questions and being supportive. So this is a good place if you're a new gardener to help get you going in the right direction. Shelly Cook is wondering, are manure and compost use in, used interchangeably? Um, yes and no. And so compost is decomposed organic matter and manure hasn't been decomposed yet. And so if you're using them as a soil amendment, which is often the case, they're, they're both good. It's just that when you put manure into the soil, it needs to be broken down. It needs to be decomposed by the soil organisms. Whereas the compost has already been decomposed or mostly decomposed. So the nutrients are available from the compost much quicker than they would be from the manure. I think generally manure is best used in a compost pile and a compost pile helps break down the manure faster 
then it would break down if you just buried it into the soil. So while their purpose is similar, the actual use and the actual way they're used is different. And, and so it's a choice of whether you want to, man, want to compost manure or put it into the soil directly. Uh, just be aware that how quickly it decomposes and then releases its nutrients into the soil. That's the big difference in, in choosing one over the other. <clears throat> um, but you can certainly use both. And I use raw uh, manure, like I mentioned earlier. I use alpaca manure and chicken manure raw just spreading on top of my wood chip mulch and just let it leach down through the mulch into the soil and let those nutrients gradually improve the soil. I'm not in a rush around my fruit trees and my fruit bushes. I am in more of a rush in my vegetable garden because I'll be growing usually earlier or sooner to when I amend and so I want those nutrients available as soon as possible. Sherry says, I'm a published author and will be glad to help with writing scripts for you. Well, thank you, Sherry. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I love doing my own scripts and my own writing, but, but maybe I'll open the door to, to having a guest at some point in the future. And I'll keep you in mind, Sherry. Thanks so much for that. Uh, they, yeah, I want, I'm just thinking about doing the AI just to, to show the difference between what what a real Gardner Scott video is and what an AI produced video from Gardner Scott looks like and and just see where we're at in that AI spectrum at this point. And so um, Frederick Von Kold is wondering, is it best to use a compost and synthetic fertilizer for a garden? Uh, and I'll treat that as it best to use compost or synthetic fertilizer for the garden. So. I'm not a fan of synthetic fertilizers. I am a big fan of compost. And it's all in how I approach gardening. It's all about the soil. Good soil leads to good plants. Good plants leads to a good harvest or a good bloom or a good whatever it is you're looking for in your garden. The synthetic fertilizer can accomplish that. It's giving the plants the same nutrients they need and you can still get a good harvest and good blooms by using synthetic fertilizer. The problem is that that the soil life that I care so much about and that I work hard to develop, the synthet synthetic fertilizers can totally disrupt the, the soil biome. It just really messes with the bacteria and the fungi and all the insects that are living in that soil. The synthetic fertilizer disrupts the whole normal cycle of the soil. And it, and it really is a cycle of life. It's, it's, it's called the soil food web. And you can, you can see videos and articles about that. And so the soil food web introducing the organic matter, having those organisms alive to make the, the nutrients available to the plants, for me, promotes a much healthier garden. So I stay away from synthetics. So to, to ask me, I would say compost is better because I don't use synthetic fertilizers. But if you don't care about the soil and if you're after those quick results and if you don't mind paying for the fertilizers, then that's okay. There, there's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of gardeners garden that way. The time I spend improving my soil, other gardeners spend fertilizing their plants. And, and there's a big difference with that. When I use fertilizers, like in my containers, I'm using the fertilizer to improve the soil. I'm not fertilizing the plant. And so that's a, a key way to look at which approach you take. Are you fertilizing the soil or are you fertilizing the plant? And do you want to use chemicals or not? And it's those synthetic chemicals and, and it holds true across the garden. It, it's just something I stay away from. But that's just me. That's just the way I garden. So when I recommend a method based on my own results, I recommend that organic method and staying away from, from the synthetic chemicals. And I've had good results. Uh, I haven't had 
the best results because I know people that have some incredible gardens because all they're doing is using synthetic fertilizers and they can get incredible plants. But I like being closer to nature and, and having a little more control over the, the life in my garden, both above ground and below ground. Hello, colorblind gardener. My biggest issue is telling when things are ripe, especially with all the different color of tomatoes. Double sow if you forget what it's supposed to look like. Yeah, I talked a little bit about this. Was it last week? Last week or the week before I was talking about tomatoes and, and a few ways to tell when the tomatoes are ripe. Uh, I've got some tomatoes that I've been enjoying from my grow tent downstairs. And I actually have some tomatoes that are just ready to harvest in my greenhouse right now. And one of the easiest things that I use with the, the cherry tomatoes, those are the ones that I'm growing right now, is I just give a very slight tug. If it comes off, it's ready. If it stays on the plant, it's not ready. And so the plant will naturally release its grip on the fruit when the fruit is ripe. Because in the plant, from the plant's perspective, the ripe fruit is what falls to the ground and those seeds grow into new plants. So it's not going to fall off the plant until it's ripe. So just a slight tug is enough to tell whether it's ripe or not. And then depending on the tomato and, and bigger tomatoes, this is a little bit easier. Just a really soft squeeze of the tomato as well. If you be, just lightly squeeze it and it's hard as a rock, it's not ripe. But if you gently squeeze it and it is a little soft, there's a little bit of give to it, then it's probably ripe or close to it. So harvest a tomato and then taste it and determine is it ripe or not ripe. And then the next time you go out, you can still do that squeeze test. But now, but you first have a frame of reference from having harvested that, that initial tomato that you got on the plant. So there's a couple ways of doing it. I, I grow so many varieties now that I'll forget what color they're supposed to be. And those are the two ways that, that I use most often to determine whether my tomatoes are ripe. And it, it works pretty well for me. haven't had an issue. Because I, I forget which, which variety I was growing. There's a variety a couple years ago that I kept waiting for the color to change. And then I finally went out and did the little squeeze test and they were mushy. I had waited way too long because it wasn't going to turn into the color I thought it was going to turn into. And so you can save yourself from the tomatoes getting too ripe by, by doing some of those tests on a regular basis. When, when you think it's getting close, <clears throat> Rafaela is wondering, should we worry about the chemicals from the smoke tainting our plants and soil? I wouldn't worry. There's really not a lot you can do about it. And, and, and when the, the forests are burning, the, the likelihood of the chemicals that might come from a petroleum plant that was on fire, completely different. And so I'd, I'm more worried about breathing in the smoke, especially if you have any type of lung issues. That's a much more serious thing to, to be thinking about. But, but uh, I'm not worried and haven't been worried in the past about the smoke. If you have a lot of the smoke and you're concerned about the the vegetables and the fruit that you're harvesting, just make sure you wash them off very well before you eat them and it shouldn't be a concern. But no, that's that's not something that that I worry about and, and think it's really much to be concerned with. Nancy Rudy, my first year in a green stock and the plants are small, advice. Um, and so it depends on the plant, it depends on your weather. All of my plants are small right now because it's just been so cold. And it's been so rainy, a lot of my plants have yellow leaves because they've been getting too much water. And so first look at your weather conditions. If it's been cold or extra wet or extra dry, that could explain why the plants aren't growing as big as you might expect. The variety and how long it takes for that plant to grow to produce could be another factor. There are plants that just take a long time to grow. Carrots are like that. 
they just seem to take weeks and weeks and weeks and they just stay small and then suddenly it seems like they over they grow overnight and so you'll wait five weeks for your carrots to to show just a few inches of growth and then a couple of weeks later they're 12 inches tall and that seemed to happen in just a few days so it depends on the plant as to how quickly it's going to grow and then it also depends on your soil in, in a green stock or in any container the soil needs to have the nutrients and like we were talking about earlier store-bought soil or store-bought potting mix may not be ready to support your plants it might not have fertilizer in it at all and it usually has compost but that compost is often pretty chunky it's often forest products that's how they label it on the bag and so it's little bits of bark and wood chunks and those aren't offering any nutrients to your plant and so did you add fertilizer to your potting mix or to whatever soil you're using in your green stock if you didn't add fertilizer that could be an issue and so in my green stocks I, i'm not fertilizing my big garden area but i do fertilize my green stock i showed that in the video that i released over the weekend i'll add fish emulsion sometimes a a balanced fertilizer to my green stock first in the soil i make my own soil but then as the plants are beginning to grow i'll fertilize the green stock so those those are some things to think about in in containers of all type particularly green stocks they're they're very effective at growing plants but you still need to feed the plants and the soil may not be doing that for you so consider using a balanced fertilizer or depending on the plant one that might be a little bit higher in nitrogen that's why i show in that video my basil which i'm trying to grow nice big green leaves will benefit from nitrogen so i used fish emulsion which is a high nitrogen natural fertilizer and my basil is doing great but i'm not going to use that same fertilizer in the green stock right next to it where i'm growing beans and a high fertilizer for a high nitrogen fertilizer is not best for beans so you do need to balance and choose the right kind of fertilizer for the plants that you're growing moon dust says i prefer organic anyways I don't really want myself, my son, or my husband injecting any chemicals, and I've noticed that the grocery stores are going more organic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I like organic growing, and and part of it is is for the chemical concern, but mostly it's just because I I have found that a garden in balance works better. And so, talking about the squash bugs earlier. And I think last week we were talking about aphids a little bit. I really don't have, I haven't seen an aphid yet this year. I've seen some ladybugs. And so if there's ladybugs, there's usually an aphid or some other insect for the ladybug to eat. But I have all my grasses and my herbs and my flowers. And I have the protected areas in the winter. And I have a healthy environment that's already happening in my garden after three years. And I've achieved that organically. And so now nature is working with me, or I'm working with nature to benefit my plants and to get good harvests and to have that healthy crop that I don't have to worry about the, the chemicals, synthetic or otherwise, that may have been sprayed on them. So um, good for you, Moon Dust. I, I, I encourage organic gardening and and it's not that hard and it really can save money in the long run as well so um, keep going with that it's a, that's a nice gardening path to start venturing down and it's one of those things that i'm guessing you'll realize the more you do it the more you appreciate it dusty flats is saying one thing i've learned during this extreme heat drought is i can grow radishes if they are under shade I'm sure that's with beets as well. Yes, absolutely. And so in, in talking about growing those plants as I was about the, the, the fall crop that you start in summer, having some shade cloth if the days are staying hot and those seedlings are emerging, uh, a little bit of shade 
definitely will make a difference on those plants. So you're exactly right. That's one of those things that can help those plants as you start moving forward with them. Okay, still looking for your questions. I see a lot of discussion back and forth, and I do appreciate that. But by all, my, all means, ask your questions. Urban Chicken Mama is wondering, with all the talk about plastic leaching into everything, I wonder how much might be in our soil and how it affects our gardens. And so I've tried doing a little bit of research on this and, and reading some studies. Not a lot of studies have been done for the home gardener. There's some stuff out there more directed towards farm research. And, and basically what I take away is microplastics are everywhere. You're probably seeing stories about the microplastics in our drinking water and in the oceans and in our fish, and it, it is definitely a problem. So you can assume that there are microplastics that are going to be in our soil. But from what I've read so far is that they're not affecting our plants. Because you have to think about how a plant works. And so even though there might be plastics in the soil, the, the breakdown of that plastic will differ but depending on what kind of plastic it is but once it's broken down usually by the bacteria sometimes by the fungi sometimes by just weather forces the chemicals that are released may or may not be absorbed by the roots of the plant so just because there's plastic residue in the soil does not mean that our plants are absorbing that because our plants need the micronutrients and the macronutrients to grow. And so they aren't sucking up some of those artificial chemicals that don't match their particular requirements. And so they'll remain in the soil. There are some plants that will absorb the heavy metals and will absorb salt and potentially could be absorbing some plastic residue but those are usually pretty specialized plants and they're not generally the kind of plants that we're growing in our vegetable garden so i i'm not concerned about it just because i i think because of the way the plants grow because of the biology of the plant the likelihood of it absorbing leached plastic and then transferring that into the fruit and then into me, there's a bigger problem of me just drinking water out of a plastic bottle, I think, than, than nature. Nature tends to neutralize a lot of that stuff. And, and that's why I, I don't think it's that big of an issue. And, and that's kind of what a lot of the, the studies or the, the few studies I've seen are saying, that, that the soil ends up neutralizing a lot of what would be perceived as hazardous and so uh, don't worry too much about it just keep growing the way you're growing and and things hopefully will work out denver 1865 hello to you i hope you're enjoying these beautiful days we're having can turnips be winter sown oh sure uh just about anything you're growing in your garden can be winter sown i i, I used to think that that winter sown seeds would be best for the seeds that can handle cold conditions and turnips fall into this category so so beets and turnips and carrots and broccoli and uh, spinach you know all those kind of plants they the sowing the seeds in winter and then as soon as the soil warms up and the temperatures warm enough for them to germinate they can begin growing that is true and that is a very effective way to grow some of those plants because you might actually get a head start on the season where you would plan to put your turnips in the ground let's say the second week of april depending on where you live and you winter sow them well the actual conditions are suitable for that turnip the last week of march and so you may gain a couple weeks on the season by winter sowing but what I've found this year, and I've known it, I just didn't necessarily recognize it, 
is winter sowing actually works for most seeds. I've got, you'll see it in, in the video coming up on Thursday, I've got a lot of cilantro growing in one of my beds. And I didn't sow any of those seeds. All of those seeds just fell from my cilantro plants last year. And so they were just resting on the soil all winter. Effectively, I winter sowed cilantro seed. Now cilantro doesn't like cold conditions. This year, once the conditions were suitable, once the soil was warm enough, and once there was enough sun, even my cilantro seeds started sprouting. So you can pretty much winter sow everything. It's just a question of how organized you are and what it is you choose to, do, to, to, to sow. And I think turnips are one of those things that you can, you can easily get away with. The, the one concern that I would have based on my experience this year is if you live in a really rainy area, you do have the potential for some of those seeds rotting early in the spring before the conditions are wet. So just be aware of that. But uh, say give it a try. It's one of those things that uh, you have a couple seeds, throw them in the ground this winter and see what happens next year. You may discover it's a easier way for you and something that you want to continue moving forward with. Uh, Jeffrey says a plant cannot tell the difference between organic and synthetic for nutrition. Absolutely. You are completely right. And, and that's why you can get such good results by using synthetic fertilizers because as far as the plant is concerned, it's, it's a nutrient. And it, it will suck up what it needs and use what it needs. And if it's there to use, it will use it. So that, that's why synthetic fertilizers are, are what's used, particularly to industrial agriculture because the plant doesn't know is happy that it's growing and reaching that point that it can put its fruit out or whatever it, it's growing if you're harvesting the roots whatever it happens to be it just likes the nutrients jason saying hello scott hello jason great live chat thank you every time i purchase a starter i see an improvement within one to two days in plant vigor and color when planted in my organic soil awesome best wishes to you well thank you uh yeah that's that's one of those things the uh, I've been taking pictures. The I did the video last month with Eli, and I put the tomatoes in the ground. We had a brief stint of some really good weather, and then it just got so cold, and those tomato plants were really suffering. And I had more plants in my greenhouse as backups, and I was so tempted to pull the, the plants from that bed. But that's the same bed that I had the soil tested in an, in an earlier video. I did soil testing on that bed earlier this year, and that bed is packed with nutrients. I haven't added any fertilizer, haven't added any chemicals to that bed since I built it. And I decided that I needed to trust my soil. And I did. And those little weak tomato plants that were so close to being pulled because they weren't doing well are doing great now. And it's all about the soil. So, uh, I, I, and I'm with you. I'm, I, today I went out to water and it's like, wow, there's already flowers on this tomato plant. And two weeks ago I was planning on pulling it. So have faith that, 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 that organic soil that you are working to improve will definitely affect the vigor of the plant once you get it to the point that it's healthy and it and those nutrients are available absolutely cd hollow karen yay i have blossoms in my watermelon cantaloupe tomatoes and peppers in zone three canada good for you that is fantastic that is such a good feeling when you get to that point and you can actually start enjoying the 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 fruits of your labor literally so hopefully you'll be getting fruits developing soon that, that's absolutely fantastic while i'm thinking about it let me go ahead and talk about the background today this comes from amy steinberger and thank you so much for sharing this amy there's isn't this a beautiful garden i just absolutely love it and you can see the fencing in the back and the fencing on the side 
next to a hillside that, that runs up and away from the garden and lots of trees. But there's an open space for gardening and all the beautiful flowers and all the plants growing in those those high metal raised beds. Everything just looks great. And you can see a little bit of bamboo trellising on, on the bed right next to me. But these metal arches are, are just really great. And, and I want to point out, if, if you can, to the, the way that they're mounted. And I, haven't, I actually haven't seen this before. I've been asked about how to use an arch between metal beds. And my normal answer is, is kind of what I did with my hoops or, or my arches. I did a video about this three years ago where I was building my arches between my wooden raised beds. And I actually buried the arch base in the bed for stability and then added some vertical support. Well, you can see that these are actually anchored, screwed in to the side of the metal bed rather than being buried. So I think that's a that's a really interesting way to to put trellises or to put an arch like these on your metal beds because the, the, the corrugated metal beds are relatively new in gardening. And so we're all still trying to discover the best way to use them. So thank you, Amy, for sharing that with us because that gives us an idea of how we can mount something like this. But I, I just love, you can see the, the vines that are starting to grow up. Those look like they might be uh, a squash plant of some type growing up that, that tall arch. And then all of the other plants that are growing in the beds this just looks like a really nice, healthy garden. And you can see, of course, the pathways in between all of these beds is mulch. Looks like it's probably a wood chip mulch. And so that's a great way to keep your garden clean, to cut down on the weeds between the beds. And so this is just a really nice, pretty, looks to be efficient garden with some nice ideas that we can use, especially those arched trellises. So if you're trying to figure out a way to use arches as trellises, take it from Amy and maybe this will give you some ideas. So uh, the flowers though, that we've been talking about insects today. The more flowers you can add to your garden, the fewer insect pests you're going to have. It, it's just that simple because those flowers will be attracting the animals, and the predatory insects that will take care of your pests. And so that's probably one reason I, I look at all these big leaves, leaves that are growing up the trellises and they look nice and green and healthy and I don't see any damage. And it's probably because of those kind of, of uh, beneficial insects and animals that are being attracted to the garden. So thank you for sharing, Amy. This is a wonderful space and I'm glad that, that we can show the others what you're what you're doing in your garden as well. Uh, and, and it is. It's always nice to, to see what others are doing. I, I always get ideas from your gardens as well. When you share your picture with me, I'm always thinking of, of things that I can do similarly to improve what I'm growing. Jen Van Brunt is wondering, when should I give up on cabbage that is ravaged by cabbage moths? Um, I, I, like most gardeners, try to take it to the very end and I give them as much a chance as possible. But the time to give up is when it's just not worth it anymore. If you're trying to grow a big head cabbage and it's going to need four weeks to develop a head and you don't have four weeks left in your season, then it's time to give up. If, like now in summer, there's enough time to grow something else, then go ahead and pull those cabbage plants and plant something else. And so those are the two big things I look at. Can I grow something else? And is it just not enough time left in my season to keep growing what I'm trying to grow? Other than that, keep those plants because there are other plants that those those cabbage moths, the, the caterpillars are really the ones that are going to be doing the most damage from the cabbage moth and plant those other plants in other areas and use those ravaged plants as magnets to attract the moths and the caterpillars because they're looking for weak plants. 
And then you can pluck them off and put some sticky traps and try to deal with that population. But they're not going to bother the other plants because they're so focused on the weak ones. So uh, giving up is a personal choice and it, and it can be a very difficult choice to make. But, but think about those considerations. It's for most of us, we have limited garden space. And so if we're growing something that just is a waste, it's not going to give us a harvest and it's just taking up our time and energy, then it's usually not really needed. Something else can take up our time and energy and often give us better results. CJ Don, hello to you. I bought a six variety basil seeds. One type is growing faster. Should I be separating them? Um, and, and so it depends on how you're planning to grow them. I, in my green stock, am growing seven different varieties and I have them separated by variety. But in another area of my garden, I've intermixed the basil plants because I'm growing them more as an ornamental. I'm letting them flower. I like basil flowers, especially the purple ones. And so uh, it depends on why you're growing it and where you're growing it. But if you're recognizing that one is growing faster and you want to separate those, maybe to collect the seed, then by all means do that. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, I'd say a good answer either way. You don't have to separate them, but separating them might give you the advantage of having the seeds from those plants that grew the fastest and did the best. And, and that's often a way that I like to to approach my seeds. I save the seeds from the plants that grow the fastest and grow the best. And if I can identify those by putting them in a separate area, by all means, that makes the whole process a little bit easier. Mr. Graham 13 had tomatoes that self-sowed and did better than my transplants. This fall, I'm gonna plant some tomatoes where I want for the spring. That gets back to the winter sowing, absolutely. And it ties in with the idea of saving seeds. And so if you've got a tomato that has self-sown because it just fell from the plant last year, those are the seeds that I would want to be saving for the future. And exactly, you can you can winter sow the 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 tomato seeds just just as I was talking earlier with some of the other plants and saying just about everything can be winter sowed. Yeah, by all means, winter sow tomato plants, and when the conditions or when, when tomato seeds and when the conditions are right, they'll definitely start growing again. Uh, I've had tomato volunteers. I, I've actually weeded out some tomato volunteers this year. As bad a year as it was for the transplants going in, I did have some tomato plants growing from the seeds that fell last year. So always an option for one of those things. Um, <clears throat> Patty's wondering, would you discuss muriate of potash 0060? And so um, when you see 0060, that means by weight, it's 0% nitrogen, 0% phosphorus, and 60% potassium. So this is a high phosphate kind of fertilizer. And you'll generally see these type of fertilizers used for bulbs, for flower bulbs, and you'll mix it into the soil and then plant the bulb because the, the, the potassium, while it it promotes the overall growth of the, the, the plant. The, the specific effect of that much really isn't needed. I've seen people use this in their vegetable garden if, if they have really, really poor soil, but it's usually one of those situations that if you know your soil is deficient in potassium, then you can add it to a high phosphate fertilizer and now and then you add it if, depending on what you're using and so like with bulbs you have the, the high phosphorus and high potassium and that helps benefit the bulb because nitrogen when you fertilize with nitrogen it moves through the soil very easily it gets down to the, the chemical makeup of those particular nutrients but when you start talking about 
potassium, it's not moving through the soil like nitrogen would. So you need to put it in place when you put the plant in place. Generally, potassium, if you just spread it on top of the soil and then water, it's not going to water in and it's not going to work its way down to the roots and it's really not going to be that effective. So I, I, that's a really high percentage and I would, you know, first ask why you think you need it, if your soil needs it, and what kind of plants you're going to grow to see if they need that much potassium. Uh, and then from there, decide if it's something that, that, that you want to consider to improve your soil. So I hope that, that helps a little bit. You know, potash is one of those things, you, the potassium comes from potash, and potash comes from the ash that came from fireplaces, and it's been used in gardens for centuries. It can affect the pH of the soil. It can make the soil more alkaline. So if you use something like a fertilizer, it doesn't necessarily affect the pH like you would if you were using ashes in your garden. But the, the uh, overall effect is still pretty much the same. Okay, let's see. I know we're getting close to the end, so I'm going to scroll down to the bottom and work up a little bit and see what I missed. And it looks like I missed a super chat. And so let's go ahead and our super sticker from NKC978. Thank you so much for that. I do appreciate that contribution and appreciate that, that you're here today. Thank you so much for that. And oh, there you are again, NKC978. Thank you again with a question this time. When liquid fertilizing, should I soak the soil first with just water or it doesn't water? Um, that's actually a good question. So whenever whenever I add fertilizer, I water first. And, and much of it gets with what I was just talking about. The fertilizers we're using don't move through the soil evenly, effectively. The nitrogen moves better than the phosphorus and the potassium. For it to move better through the soil, you, starting with a moist soil is better. So if you were to take a liquid fertilizer and pour it onto your soil, that potassium in particular, when it hits the soil, it's locking to those soil grains. And so it's not moving through the soil. You water and it just locks into the soil right where it hits. And so now the top inch of your soil might be very, very rich with nutrients. Deeper down, not so much. So by watering, you, you allow a little more time for that liquid fertilizer to work its way down and to benefit the lower levels of the soil, which is where the roots are going to be growing. So uh, yeah, I, I always soak my soil first before I, I move forward with the fertilizers like that. And also if I'm expecting a rain, because rainwater actually ha might have some ozone in it, and that, that ozone is beneficial for the soil. I will often water my soil before a rainstorm, a thunderstorm in particular, because the same thing. When it starts raining, it's those top inch or top two that's going to get all the water. But if the soil is already moist, when it rains, that water is going to move through the soil and actually reach deeper. So there's a lot of times that, that I soak my soil before I work in the soil because I, I think it benefits the soil life, but it also affects how the nutrients are, are moving through the soil as well. So uh, just one of those extra little tasks that you can take on, but it, it might pay dividends for how the nutrients are being used from by the plants. Um, so... Uh, yeah, Denver 1865, not all gardens want potash or ashes from your fires. It's best to test. And I did, it's probably almost five years ago now, I did a video where I talk about using the ash in the garden. And I don't do it because my soil is alkaline. And I know it's alkaline because I've tested it. 
I can get the pH down closer to neutral when I add organic matter, but by adding ash to my soil here in Colorado and in Denver, uh, our, our gardens will not benefit from that potash and from the ashes because uh, just the, the way that the soil works. And so just be aware of that. And, and that the pH affects lots of other things. The Colorado State University does not recommend using phosphorus, those high phosphate fertilizers in our soil for the same reason, because phosphorus in a high pH soil isn't absorbed by the plant. And so unless you're gonna take the time to amend the soil and bring the pH down, a lot of those fertilizers are just wasted. The plant can't even use them. And so, there's, yes, there's a lot to learn about soil and fertilizers and plants. And yes, it takes years of experience to get it close to figured out. And even then something changes. So if you're new to gardening and things just aren't working well and you're using fertilizer, well, that could be part of the problem is that the soil is not suitable for the fertilizer that you're using. And so that's a big reason why I focus on my soil and try to get the healthy soil and not even worry about the fertilizers and it starts in my region with poor soil and high pH. Jeremy Ransom, hello. Do you think it would be too late for me to plant ginger? My last average frost date is December 12th. Um, you might actually still have some time. And so, and if you if you get a nice good chunk of ginger to to put in the ground, I bet you you you've got enough time to to have a pretty good plant develop and definitely some root development, and you can harvest you know before that second week of December, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if you don't get a pretty good ginger crop. So I go for it. it it's not something I can do in in my Colorado garden, but uh, that's because my first frost is usually the end of September, but go for it. I, I think I'd, I'd love to be able to grow ginger outside in my area. It's just one of those things that I can't, so I don't, but I think you should try it. And then let us know about it in, in the months ahead when we're, we're talking. I'll, I'll definitely be doing live streams at the end of the season where we'll be talking about what worked and what didn't work and what lessons learned and I hope you'll come back and tell us how the ginger worked sometime in November or December. That'd be fantastic. So uh, <clears throat> I, I mention on a fairly regular basis the idea that you observe your garden. You take a good close look at what's happening in your garden. But it's been a little while since I've talked about the firsts, looking for that, that thing that you haven't seen yet in your garden. So like in a, in a zone three Canadian garden when you first have those flowers of the squashes and melons. That's a big deal. And those are the things that you should be looking for on a regular basis about everything. And if you take the time, that's again a reason why I hand water is to take the time in my garden and observe my garden and look at my plants. If you take that time every day, you'll find a first. And it not only is it satisfying and hopefully brings joy, but especially after you've put some effort into whatever it is you see, it just makes it more worthwhile. So I think about three weeks ago, I was standing in the garden underneath my archway where last year I had lots of flowers. The flowers are coming up this year, but we're still weeks away from bloom. But a hummingbird came into that arch and was right in front of my face and fluttering and looking at me like, dude, where's the flowers? And then flew away. And I love hummingbirds in my garden. So since then, for almost three weeks, I put up my hummingbird feeders. I've been keeping them filled with nice, fresh sugar water. No hummingbirds. Doesn't matter. The bees are happy. The bees are really liking the sugar water in my hummingbird feeder because of the crazy weather. A lot of the flowers that might be up at this time of year aren't up. So the bees are looking for food. So they're eating from my hummingbird feeder. So great. I love seeing the bees. I love helping out the bees. I keep replacing the sugar water. And today, this morning, I was out in the garden. 
watering, doing my normal plans, but I just stepped out. Mala's running around. She's happy that we're outside. It was shortly after the sun rose, so there was still that little bit of a darkness to the sky. And I look to the archway, and there's a hummingbird feeding on one of those hummingbird feeders. The first hummingbird of the season. I hope it comes back every morning. I hope it brings its friends. But that's one of those firsts that I've mentioned before that I always look for. That first hummingbird. Because it usually takes weeks of preparation. It takes weeks of having those hummingbird feeders out, ready. So when the hummingbird finds them, it will return. And I have no doubt it will return. And I will be out in the morning looking for that hummingbird and hoping that they start popping up in the afternoon and early evening, which is really the best time to enjoy the hummingbird. So I just wanted to share that. I hope you have some nice firsts that you have been enjoying. I hope this week brings you some of those wonderful firsts in your garden. I'm hoping this week to harvest my first tomato from my greenhouse. I'll definitely let you know about that next week because it's close. It's close. Maybe tomorrow I'll be harvesting it. That's so wonderful to get that first tomato of the season. Highlight of the entire year. So next week we'll talk about some of those firsts. I encourage you to find your own first that you can share with us next week. And of course, we'll be back at the normal time on Monday. I hope you're enjoying your holiday weekend if it is indeed a holiday for you and just have a fantastic time in your garden over the course of the next week. Stay safe, stay happy, and of course, enjoy gardening.